पंकजम सुरा सुरैर्वंदित दिव्य रूपम भुक्ति मुक्ति दिम भावासारे न सदा नरा जय जय गंगे जय हर गंगे 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 Outset. Let me share my happiness in being here this morning with all of you, and congratulating you for the phenomenal work that you have undertaken in this country. as an immigrant population as pioneers of really creating a legacy for indians living abroad something that your future generations here could carry with you with them what you have achieved so far is not a simple thing at all it has taken great visionaries people of phenomenal insights who understand human life human needs especially needs of the hindu society the challenges we have faced as a civilization over hundreds of years taking everything into account and seeing where we are at today how empowered or disempowered we are today when it comes to our own culture and customs to be able to put an immigrant population in a proper framework so that your children don't just grow up merely with a lot of dhana lakshmi <laughs> but they grow up with ashta lakshmi growing up with ashta lakshmi is finding a balance a happiness in life coming from a good home a good partner a good family it includes santana lakshmi saubhagya lakshmi vara lakshmi griha lakshmi it's not just dhana lakshmi that is going to make your life successful and so being able to put together life in its balance you are the immigrant generation that has come in here and therefore what you do right is going to become the legacy for the future generations by the same token what you miss will be missed by all that is to follow and therefore here we have in 
Surya has been known, has been lauded for its knowledge traditions. Not just a few decades ago, but for centuries, thousands of years. And so for us, Panditaha Pujyante Sarvatra. Really, scholarship, learning, knowledge has always been given the highest place and what to talk of self-knowledge, Atma Vidya. The Vedas begin their own framework of what a human being is supposed to live by, how we educate ourselves. They say, it is said in the Veda, Dwe Vidya Vedita Vye Paracha Aparacha. Vidya, knowledge for us is twofold, para vidya and apara vidya. In the world, modern education today, knowledge is also twofold, but it's divided as religious knowledge and secular knowledge. Religious knowledge is knowledge in the biblical, what you call studying the Bible or the Quran. These are all called call religious knowledge, religious learning. And the other is secular learning. Your yes, secular subjects in the school, but in the Vedic model, which is our, our tradition, we talk about Paravidya and Aparavidya. And therefore understand that we need to understand what these two terminologies mean when we say apara vidya it is knowledge of the other of the world the knowledge of the universe the knowledge of astronomy the knowledge of geology the normal knowledge of physics of chemistry the knowledge that exists in the universe is apara vidya then what is para vidya it's a knowledge of the subject who is studying about the objective universe. So it's the knowledge of the objective world and the knowledge of the subject. The knowledge of the subject has other expressions called Atma Vidya, Brahma Vidya, Paramatma Vidya. Both these knowledges have been given their due place in our tradition. Everyone who went to school also studied, as they studied Aparavidya, they also knew there is something called Paravidya. Because it is only in the understanding of Paravidya that you can understand what is spiritual India. Unless I have an insight into Paravidya, India for me will remain a secular country. <laughs> The fact is, India is a sacred nation. Because its culture is sacred, the Upanishads begin with Isha Vasimidam Sarvam. All that is here is divine. All that is here is divine. What do we know about divinity? <laughs> all we know is chair and table and all that is here is fan and mic. When you say all that is here is divine, is it a floating statement? Or is there a, a third eye through which you perceive the universe differently? That vidya is called paravidya, understand? And that is precisely what made our country what it is, unique to its, its sacred traditions. We'll talk about culture in the second session of mine. But this session is committed to knowing what is dharma. 
Vishwa Hindu Parishad has chosen two books of the Purna Vidya's 12-year course series. In the, in the junior school, one is called Ramayana and the other is Bhagavatam. And so my focus is going to be Ramayana in the first session and Bhagavatam in the second session and focusing on Ramayana, understand, it is not just telling stories. It's not a mere storytelling session, it's a session for giving them, giving the children an understanding of what is values. Because Sri Rama is a Dharma Avatara. Dharma Avatara. That means everything that Dharma is to be, what you need to know about Dharma, if you knew Sri Rama's life, Dharma becomes clear. Dharma is, there are two definitions. Dharati lokan iti dharma. Dharati lokan, that which holds that principle, that universal ethic, that holds the universe together, that holds the world together, is called dharma. Dhriyate anena iti dharmaha is a second definition of dharma. It is that which is followed by the dharmikas, the ethics, the values which are lived, the living ethics in a society is called dharma. The living ethics in a society, what is it? Does it differ from one culture to the other? Is it all the same? If it's all the same, we have no problem. Whatever kids do at school, what you do at home is all the same. Whether you, whether you learn Carnatic music or you learn jazz, it's the same. <laughs> But no, we find dharma is not as universal as we would like to romanticize about it. Dharma carries its specificities based on its context, based on so many factors. Dharma, as much as it's samanya, it is also vishesha, it is also contextual. And so there are many, many, many shades and repercussions to understand what is dharma. Dharma is looked upon as karma. Dharma is looked upon as purusharthas, one of the purusharthas. Dharma has, has so many connotations. But let us look at the two specific meaning. Dharati lokaniti dharmaha. Driyate anena iti dharma. Shri Rama is that avatara, that incarnation that represents both. Why he is so worshipped? Because he represents both. And what is this both? Let me explain myself clearly. You are not going to get this in the books because the books go with the stories giving you the outcome of the principles I am, I am presenting here. My point here is to give you some master key with which you can unlock the whole Ramayana. And therefore the principles are important to understand. Every human being, when we grow up, we grow up with the growth of a human child, remember, is threefold. We have physical growth, we have cognitive growth, and 
Anyone want to guess? Emotional growth. Good. Physical growth of a human child is called natural growth. It is an unaided growth. A growth for which you don't have to do anything except eat, sleep, exercise, make sure you're not knocked down by a, a flying bike in the neighborhood. And you will grow. Suddenly one day you begin to shave. You are ready to bear a child. This physical growth is called unaided natural growth. What is cognitive growth? Cognitive growth is a growth that requires support, aid. And that growth we get through our educational system. It is a growth process where you are learned, you are taught how to think, how to abstract, how to postulate, how to deduct, how to arrive at conclusions. These are all called a educational process and hence those who don't go through proper education, they remain what? <laughs> they remain illiterate. They are unable to manage their accounts, their money, their things. They cannot handle organizational skills. All this requires, wherever there is a logical, what you call frameworks, people have a hard time. Why? Because illiterate. So one who goes through good cognitive education for cognitive growth, well, you can you can become a scientist, you can keep studying all your life, but at some point in adulthood we stop. <laughs> a formalized cognitive education is stopped once you become an adult and there is a minimum uh, given to you by the age 24 or so and now parents say what? Bhoot ho gaya. Enough. Now it's time for the next stage of life. <laughs> Why? What is the next stage going to bring? There is one important growth which needs to be addressed. This is the third growth called emotional growth. Is emotional growth aided or unaided? It is fully aided. <laughs> We can't say unaided, in fact, it's where there is good parentage, where there is good, good, good uh, love, family life. We find emotionally the children grow up well nurtured. Healthy competitions, siblings in the family, all this helps a child grow up to being an emotional adult. Physical adult, emotional adult, cognitive adult. Understand? But in this adulthood, life is not complete. We are never satisfied by being merely adults. <laughs> What's the big deal when you, you have your degree and then you, you no, okay, I brought up well. Now what? What else? Human beings need to excel. There is a almost like a human longing to excel, to excel, to excel. And therefore we always work for excellence, not for mere adulthood. You have physical growth, but then you want to enter into the Olympics. <laughs> not merely enter, you want to have the championship, is it not? You want to earn the gold medal for your country. This dream of excellence is how the human life moves ahead. Physical excellence. And our humanity says, yes, in all civilization, those who excel 
we create a common platform a common platform where the world will acknowledge people of physical excellence we call it olympics no olympics where there is physical excellence anybody who is a olympic champion anywhere in the world he is regarded respected is it not and so human beings work for physical excellence we work for cognitive excellence too and a common platform to acknowledge cognitive excellence you have the nobel laureates your people who are acknowledged where anywhere in the world a nobel laureate walks and he is given given respect let me ask you one thing what has humanity created as a common platform for emotional excellence Do we have any platform for emotional excellence, physical excellence? We have cognitive excellence. We have. What do we have for emotional excellence? Tell me. The civilization that has a platform for emotional excellence, that has a definition of emotional excellence, is. our vedic civilization it is declared in the bhagavad gita it's declared in the upanishads and it is said atmani eva atmana tushtah sthida pragnya tada uchyate this person of emotional excellence is a sthida pragnya he is a atma with he is a brahma with <laughs> He is a person who is awakened in self knowledge, and this is the man who knows. This is the person who knows how to live, how to revel, how to be happy in himself, with himself, by himself. He needs no crutches for happiness. He doesn't need any luxuries of life. he doesn't work so hard as we do to convert luxuries into necessities <laughs> our whole life is dedicated to what converting luxuries into necessities iphone was a greatest luxury we used to respect people who had these smartphones you know <laughs> today every villager in india has a smartphone what's the big deal without which he cannot live <laughs> every child holds a smartphone <clears throat> without which he will have tantrums <laughs> luxuries become necessities <clears throat> emotional excellence was defined in our culture by our tradition by people who showed in their lives atmani eva atmana tushtah i can be happy with myself in myself by myself i can convert all needs into luxuries <laughs> converting need into luxury means what is there theek hai nahi hai to bhi theek hai this this particular what you call internal disposition is not an ordinary disposition and this is how the vedic civilization marked emotional excellence for its people such people were represented by the rishis presence of the rishi parampara and life was meant to teach us lessons in emotional excellence and therefore this relationship 
entering into the second stage of life after physical adulthood cognitive adulthood where as a as a child i am just a consumer a child is a consumer because he keeps consuming you know anything it sees puts in the mouth <laughs> whatever is there it's for me <laughs> you say bhai bhai ke sath to bhai ko bhi chocolate de do kyun this is for me no child wants to share because he is a swarthi he has to grow up because he is a child we forgive we say ah, bachcha hai but if a 55 year old does the same <laughs> he lives only for himself is all for me he will get into big trouble and therefore adulthood means emotional excellence means a life of contribution it is a shift we make from being a consumer to being a contributor and how are you going to be a contributor well begin with one more person next to you <laughs> start walking your life with a partner where you learn to look at emotions beyond your own needs beyond your own wants beyond your own with who with your loved one with that partner in life and with this second soul you learn the skill of being a contributor a giver doing your swadharma you learn the skill of being a giver i give you i give my child now you expand <laughs> your family your society and thus a a consumer becoming a contributor is called life of an adult but what about me <laughs> what about my needs well they will find their fulfillment differently not in the way as you were a child having tantrums and getting your needs fulfilled although some adults continue to do that <laughs> there are adults who are cognitively brilliant but emotionally useless you marry somebody thinking he is a great scientist doesn't mean he is going to be a super husband you know <laughs> and somebody who is a who is emotionally who who is good who is mature may not be a brilliant human being either he may not have cognitive excellence in it doesn't matter so you find this kind of this is why we are so many of us are different from each other what do you have in ramayana in ramayana we have a soul who represents a life lived by a person of emotional excellence a person of emotional excellence who is he कौन सांप्रतम लोके धनवान धनवान धर्मज्ञो दृढ़व्रत चारित्रेण चोयुक्त सर्वूतेषु को क्वेश्चन इज आस्ट बै वाल्मीकि हिमसेल्फ Hey, is there anybody on this earth who who stands with this great character who loves all beings who is a giver who has strength who is stability who is fearless such a person is is there such a person and narada tells him yes ikshvakuvam shaprabhava such a person born in the race of ikshvaku race his name is shri rama and when you look at his life you look at his the way he made decisions the choices he took 
it is a dharma which is post conventional dharma which is post conventional and what is post conventional well to know post conventional dharma we must know what is pre conventional <laughs> dharma what is conventional dharma what is dharma the tradition teaches us if there is one thing that makes us a human being it is not your material success it is not the exotic foods you eat it is said aahar nidra bhaya maithunam cha samanya metat pashu bhinnarana धर्मो ही तेषाम अधिको विशेष धर्मे न हीना पशु भी समाना वेन यू लुक एट अूमन लाइफ एन यू लुक एट लाइफ ऑफ ऑल लाइफ फॉर्म्स ऑन अर्थ वी आर वेरी कॉमन टू देम उनमें हम में कोच फर्क नहीं विथ रेफरेंस टू आहारा वी ईट दे ईट विथ रेफरेंस टू निद्रा we sleep they sleep including your leaves and trees and plants amphibians all all animals have nidra right only their nidra is predictable ours is most unpredictable when we should sleep we remain awake like night time when we should be awake we are sleepy like in a class this is this is a lot of a human being <laughs> you can predict the animal world you can never predict the human world ahara when their stomach is full they stop you know when they are sick they fast <laughs> we when we are sick we eat more <laughs> even if our stomach is full uh, full the gap between the stomach and the tongue is so big you know stomach says both ho gaya i can't hold any more tongue says de do de do de do <laughs> the craving continues <laughs> so we we really in aahara nidra <laughs> well this commitment seems to be more disciplined than ours but really speaking we are no different in these habits bhayam in fear of protecting life as much as life is dear to us so it is dear to all of them no mother hen willingly gives up her chicks for you to have chicken soup on the table for night she doesn't say yeah sure take my babies for your chicken soup no the mom and the baby is all run away once they know once they sense that you are there to take away life so bhayam that instinct to fear to protect life is there in us as much as that is there in them and maithunam the desire to propagate your species is something so instinctual for all life forms and just uh, if you are a mother a father don't think you are so unique <laughs> all life forms become moms and dads and they also beautifully take care of their young ones you then what is it that makes me special <laughs> do i have anything unique except walking on two legs <laughs> yes धर्मो ही तेषाम अधिको विशेष धर्मे न ही ना पशु समाना धर्म इज वॉट मेक्स यू अ ह्यूमन बींग यू हैव अ वेरी स्पेशल प्रिविलेज एवरी ह्यूमन बींग हैज बीन गिवन अ यूनिक ए स्पेशल प्रिविलेज टू चूज चूज the faculty of choice never take for granted 
it is the most special privilege of a human life. What you choose depends on your own samskaras. But the faculty to choose is a privilege that every one of us has. And if you have chosen dharma as your as your parameter for all your choices in life, if dharma becomes your guiding light as your parameter for all your choices, then you can call yourself truly a human being. Anything short of dharma, pashu bhis samana, you are as good as a pashu. It is dharma in every choice. As opposed to what? Well, we have choices, remember? You can choose based on your desires, your karma, your compulsions, your addictions, your dreams. You want to become a billionaire. Okay, you have a whole lifetime, you're a young man. No, I want to finish. I want to retire when I'm 35. So what are you going to do? You're going to kill everybody else to become a billionaire? So these, these wild ambitions we have, how am I going to live through my ambitions? Will karma override dharma? <laughs> Will dharma continue to guide all my desires? And so, which is going to be in the driver's seat of my, of my life is the question. A life of emotional excellence is making sure that you are, your guiding light is always dharma. Kama comes second. Artha comes second. Artha means I do things for security's sake, you know. Bank account. I must have 10 billion dollars in my bank. Okay, wonderful. Work for your goal. Nobody says don't work. But how are you going to go about? Is dharma going to guide your process or adharma? I have dharma if you do not in 10 generations I can't achieve. <laughs> oh, so you are going to compromise dharma? How else? So you mean to say your artha is more important than dharma? If you want to put it that way, you may. Understand what I am saying? With artha desires, with karma desires, artha means securities, activities for security's sake, activities for pleasure's sake, and activities for dharma's sake. When I keep dharma in front, in every time I am in my crossroads, when I keep choosing dharma, 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 then I come out a winner. I am one who is a what? My medal here is sthita pragnya. How are you going to come out a winner? In fact, people who are dharmikas are always losers. <laughs> Is it not? Look at Sri Rama. Periya dharmika, you know. He was a prince. A throne which should have rightly come to him. What happened? Hmm? Father gave some promise to mother. Never consulted him, you know. How to give, how much to give. And in father's reckless behavior, he gave a blank check. Very dangerous. Should never give a blank check. <laughs> you should have filled, you should have locked in something there. Blank check. Whatever boon you want, two boons are yours. And then he, the son was not consulted and he became the guinea pig. In this deal between dad and mom. Should he take it or not? Well, depends on which society he is living in. <laughs> is he in this century? <laughs> a 
then which society he lives is how his response is going to be. <laughs> Modern kids will say, Dad, you should have asked me, yeah? I'm not going to do, just do just because you did stupid decisions. I'm not going to follow your decisions. <laughs> These are the responses you get from children today. In fact, here we have a great classic. A great classic which really shows you what is what? How dharma is to be made the guiding principle of life, we learn from Ramayana. Lakshmana is dharmic, Bharata is dharmic. Not that they are not dharmic, Lakshmana is very dharmic. And he tells Sri Rama, when they find out that he is going to lose the throne, and tomorrow he is going to be sent away from Ayodhya. Lakshmana tells Sri Rama, Look, Anna, look, brother. Just say yes to me. You are older and so I need your consent. But I will single-handedly handle these two people. Which two people? <laughs> this king and this queen. They are our father, mother. Anna, what they have said, no father, no mother will say to their own child. Understand if you are a Kshatriya, Ruh, in your blood there is Kshatriya Tvam, then you should understand that these are our enemies. They are Shatrus, they are enemies. If they are our parents. This is wrong thinking, Tambi. <laughs> this is not correct, Lakshmana. You cannot see. Don't you know enemies return in multiple lifetimes? In one lifetime they show up as your father and mother. If you are a true Kshatriya, you should be able to recognize the enemies. These are arguments Lakshmana gives. You read Valmiki Ramayana. He gives these arguments to his older brother. You are not able to recognize <laughs> true enemies. They are enemies. They are not our parents. You just say, yes, I will shoot them down right now. It will be over with. Morning you go occupy the throne. <laughs> and Sri Rama says, no way, no way. I listened to the Agnya of the Raja. The king said, 14 years for me and the throne for Bharata, my Anuj, my younger one. And so will it be. And thus, in Sri Rama's dharma, you find a quality, a quality that is, dharma is there in Lakshmana. He's not on Ravana's side. Of course, he is with his brother. But the quality of dharma is different. What is that quality? You tell me. What is it? Which dharma appeals to you? Lakshmana's dharma or Sri Rama's dharma? Which one appeals to you? Eh? Depends. Shri Rama's dharma. Why? Because there is one principle to live a dharmic life. That principle we must understand. Without tyaga, there is no dharma. Dharma is lived only where tyaga buddhi. You have access to Tyaga in you. Not only Tyaga, there is one more quality in Sri Rama's life we find. Amazing quality. These are the two qualities what make Sri Rama post-conventional. The second quality is called 
kshama. The capacity to accommodate, the capacity to accommodate wrong done to him. When Kaikai is, what do you call, you know, cornered, when she is isolated, Bharata disowns his own mother. You know the story. Not only Bharata is disown, uh, disowns his, his mother, Raja Dasharatha himself disowns both Kaikai and Bharata and tells her, don't come near me for my, for my cremation. You are not mine anymore. Whole Ayodhya disowns Kaikai. Even you have disowned Kaikai. That's why none of your children are named Kaikai. <laughs> In Namakaranam, did you put Kaikai? In the entire Bharat Desha. Whichever century you go back, other than the original Kaikai, <laughs> there was never a second Kaikai. Why? Because we hate her. We are so thankless. We have to thank her for being there. Without her, there is no Ramayanam. There is no understanding of life. It is Kaikai who made Ramayana possible. But we are, we, we hate her. Everybody disowns Kaikai. Except Sri Rama, you know. When Bharata goes to Chitrakuta, and in Chitrakut they, they meet him, Bharata has this un unbelievable dialogue with Sri Rama to come back to Ayodhya. And Sri Rama says, no, my dharma is to go into the forest. Amazing arguments. You look at these two brothers, each one telling the other to take the throne, <laughs> where there have been civilizations that murdered their brothers and fathers to grab the throne. Look at the quality, at the nobility, at the spiritual heights that the society lived in. They argue. Bharata says, hey, are you, why are you insisting on going to the forest? I am, the throne is mine, right? I am giving it to you. <laughs> Take it, come, it is yours. Rama says, no, I cannot. How can I? Father has said this. I have to go to the forest. Okay. Okay, brother. If one of us should go to forest, right? I will be your proxy. Allow me to go to forest and you go to the, to the throne. <laughs> Let me be your proxy. Balmiki gives pages and pages of this dialogue between Bharata and Sri Rama. You want to understand dharma, here is the story of dharma. Jealousy manifests in Kaikeyi. Dharmic anger manifests in Lakshmana. You find various values manifest in different people and these people interact with each other, walk through life. Finally, Bharata loses. I have no time to go into these dialogues. He loses and then he asks for the Padukas. And when Sri Rama gives the Padukas and Bharata moves away, Sri Rama calls him and says, calls him back and says, look, promise me you will take care of your mother. Promise me you will take care of your mother. The sensitivity of dharma in Sri Rama is not ordinary. When the sensitivity is inclusive, it is called post-conventional. When the sensitivity to dharma is with our justice, 
when the right is facing the wrong, the right and wrong are on two sides of the coin. Reward and punishment is the outcome of dharma and adharma. That is called conventional dharma. All society lives with conventional dharma. This is LOC, don't cross. This is conventional dharma. Hey, you don't stand on my toe, I won't stand on yours. Conventional dharma. We all live by conventional dharma. Understand? What is pre-conventional? Pre-conventional is you follow dharma, but not out of justice. You follow dharma out of fear. Mm. Appa is coming. Let us open the book and study. <laughs> Children do this, you know. This is called pre-conventional. Why? Not because I love studies, because I'm afraid of father. If he doesn't see me doing this, team will come out of his ears. Pre-conventional dharma. When the religion tells you, 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 you don't follow, don't do as I say, you will go to hell. And they describe hell. Big tawa, <laughs> boiling hot oil. You will be put there and fried like a puppet. <laughs> when you hear all this, you say, hmm, I will follow what you say. <laughs> this is called religion brings fear. Parenting fear, school teachers give fear, politicians put fear, society gives fear. Thus, with all these fears you do the right thing. That is pre-conventional dharma. In Sri Rama, dharma is post-conventional. I'll close with a story, very, very important to know. What is Kshama in Ramayana? When Sri Rama returns after his 14 years, the three mothers are waiting to receive him. He comes back to Ayodhya. Of course, as you know, he checks to see whether Bharata's intentions are the same or has changed. He sends Hanumanji to find out. Because if it has changed, then he would not want to interfere, the own brother. But if he feels the same, today is the last day of the 14th year. And when Hanumanji goes and he sees, Bharata has started to pile up wood for, for the pyre. Because by sundown, if Sri Rama did not enter Ayodhya, Bharata had made his decision. I have no reason to live. And so he is getting ready to, to self-immolate. And Hanumanji, when he sees this, he immediately, the message goes, come reach here before sunset. Well, in that eagerness, Sri Rama comes back, goes and meets his mothers, touches their feet, and when he touches Kaikai's feet, she steps back. She says, not me. <laughs> and Sri Rama says, I'm doing namaskar and you're not blessing. This is terrible, you know. Somebody does namaskar and you pull your foot back, na? It's an insult to the other person. Hey, how, how can you put your feet back? Please bless me. And Kaikai says, who am I to bless you? I have lived here 14 years in penance just to see you be installed as a Raja. That one mistake I made, the price chitta I had to do for 14 long years. I don't want to do another mistake. <laughs> I am in no position to bless you, child. One more mistake, another 14 years, I will not be able to live. Please don't come to me for blessings. 
And Sri Rama tells her, What are you saying, mother? How can you say this? Sumitra Kausalya, they raised me in the palace as a royal prince. But who taught me life? Who's the one who was the cause, the nimittam to really take care of all these Rishi Munis in the forest? Who are being bothered, who are being hurt by the Asuras, Rakshasas? If it were not for you, they would have suffered. They would have been killed. By going into the forest, I learned what is Tyaga, what is Tapas, what it takes to be sensitive to the forest, to the life forms in the forest. I saw how the Rishis lived. It's all because of you, Mother. You blessed me. You gave me my true life. Bless me again and again. In Sri Rama's mind, there was nothing wrong done to him. So a dharma that includes dharma and adharma, understand. A dharma that includes both is called the dharma of kshama. And therefore emotional excellence is a journey of life where you move from pre-conventional, you start living a life of dharma out of fear of your elderly people around you, your religion around you, and then you graduate when you say right, wrong, I am right, of course you are wrong, I am right, you are wrong, right, wrong, right, wrong. But at some point I move away from right, wrong where I am able to embrace, hold both in my capacity of forgiveness and accommodation. And that's not possible unless there is Tyaga. And therefore Tyaga and Kshama form the two wings for the Dharma bird, pigeon to fly. In Ramayana, this is how Sri Rama Avatara teaches us Dharma. And therefore, Every episode that you teach, whether it is, you know, Ayodhya Kanda or whichever Kanda you take, we need, we need to understand the story based on the dharma value in it, the dharma value in it. You have to be able to focus on the dharma. All storytelling is meant not for entertaining the child, there is no other way you can teach dharma to children other than stories. How are you going to teach? Are you going to talk about the value system? This five-year-old and eight-year-old, what are they going to understand? You've got to present the story in a manner where the child says, no, 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 je jealousy. Uh, you ask them to enact, be kai kai, and they don't want to be kai kai. <laughs> No, give me any other role, I will not be Kaiki. They don't want to be Ravana. When they tell you that, understand that they have understood. What is dharma has gone into their hearts. And they don't want to be the bad person. <laughs> and so this is how storytelling must take place, keeping dharma in mind. And so, Driyate anena iti dharma means how dharma walked through life. With the, with the icons you have, the models, with the rishis, with the patriots, with all these people who really were revered in our society, none of them reached where they reached without tyaga. Did they? Tyaga. All patriotism is what? Nothing but tyaga. It's a definition of Tyaga. Being successful in Dharma means Tyaga must be in me. Shama must be in me. I live for my ideology and rise to it in my actual life. Dharati Lokan Dharmaha means that inclusive ethic, that post-conventional Dharma of Sri Rama which is the universal dharma, vasudhaiva kutumbakam, 
It is not mere Vasudha, the earth. It is the entire universe is one, one, one body of that infinite divine divinity. And therefore, what is it that holds the universe together? That dharma is also called dharma. When we say our dharma is sanatana, means what? <laughs> it is a dharma that can never die. It holds the universe together. It is organic to very life and living. It is connected to the laws of the universe. That is the universal dharma. And in that sanatana dharma we live. Live as what? As people who destroy all adharma. Him, apashabdam, adharmam, dushayati, sa Hindu. He is a Hindu who destroys, who removes from his life all apashabdam, all adharmam. So Hindu dharma teaching. You are teachers of Hindu dharma. <laughs> Now you know what you are in for. This is exactly what you are in for. A tradition when you share, not only they learn, your life becomes enriched a hundredfold. Because you are in sights of all these great, great characters, great avatars, and their life you begin to take in. Naturally, your children have also taken to the civilizational consciousness, the cultural consciousness, the literary consciousness of that land you have brought into your children when you can teach our literature with these principles of dharma. Okay. With this I will close and we have a, a short, uh, uh, not a break, we have first a a uh, photo session <laughs> and after this photo session we have distribution of the kit.